kids always go be cruel. Live, when we talk about living, growing up in the 70s and the early 80s, you know, back when it was just about the time when disabilities, the people with disabilities were starting to get let out of the closet. It's a lot of times back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, those generations, a lot of times, if somebody had a disability, a lot of that they would come in the closet and we kept, you know, not really in public that much because they really didn't know that much about disabilities. So um, the kids didn't understand it. I mean, although I had friends where I grew up at, it was still, still had that teasing, you know, that bullying. You can call somebody a trash or cripple or whatever every day in their life. Sooner or later, it's going to affect them or make them think, hey, maybe I am trash. Maybe I am nothing. And that in itself, you know, was hard for me to overcome. I don't know it's a strange to say, but you just, I didn't like myself. I didn't like who I was. And I was angry at God. I, God forgive me, I, I hate him. I mean, if he could have walked up in front of me, I mean, we would have go down. I had that why me complex. Why me? Why was I born with civil policy? Why do you hate me? And I think the, re the realization that God didn't love me came when I attempted suicide in 95. I OD'd on uh, pills and this guy came up to me in, in, in this afterlife experience I had. And it was a foggy, like a foggy, foggy. And um, I could see Sarah was and the guy walked up to me and put his hand on my shoulder and said, Hank, you gotta go back. And I was like, I don't want to go back. I have nothing to live for. And I can remember him saying, I'm not finished with you yet. You got a job to do. And next thing I know, we go. And my dad's sitting there holding my hand, crying. And he said, son, we didn't know you were going to make it or not. He said, you know you die. See, I know I die. I said, I know. I die. I know. I said, I don't know how long. I said, it felt like eternity. He said, no, he said, you. You died for 90 seconds. He brought you back. He said, oh, we can't do this no more. I can't really see what he said on camera. <laughs> Daddy always had a way with words. He made no full inner words. I said, uh, do you really want to kill yourself? I said, my gun's always loaded. And I said, I promise you, when you're going to pull the trigger, finish business. We had other words besides that, but that was the main thing that I wanted to get across to him. You know, hey, bro, there's no reason for you to keep killing everybody, trying to do these little false stumps to me, stunts to me, you know. And to get it across to him, bro, it was, it was tough, bro. It was, it really was. Suicide, now to me, suicide is the permanent solution to a temporary problem. I'm not proud I did it. I'm not ashamed of it. It did something in my life that had happened, that done, it's finished, but it changed me. I think if I wouldn't have had that after life experience, I think I probably would have tried it again. And probably would have succeeded. And it took me, that was in 1995. It took me 13 years to find out what he had in store for me. I'm not finished with you, Hank. So in them 13 years, I had worked to call Louisiana to raise the money for Silver Bowl. And I had stopped in and United Simple Poison one day. And I'm getting the dive tour of the facility. And we're getting ready to walk out the door. Another one of the moments in your life you'll never forget, you know. First time you ever see your spouse, you remember that forever. And I'm walking out the door and she, I'm, talk, I'm talking to her boss, Maria's boss. She's walking in and she's beautiful. I mean, gorgeous, beautiful, Hispanic woman. And I'm thinking in my mind, it's like, whoa, look at this. Wow, that's a fox. The next morning, um, one of my co-workers came to my office and 
whole time we are somebody interested in you. And I'm like, no, I'm not interested in him. No. And my, my uncle woke up, who are you talking about? Like, that new guy. Know. It's not my type. It's not my type. I remember I was um, in my dad's typing. Uh, I heard something in me like, okay, Maria, you've been praying and praying for something to happen. And then, here, it must stop being so superficial. Stop it. So, I called my, my co-worker back and said, okay, tell me a little bit about this guy. But for me, it was love at first sight. I mean, you can't help but not love Maria. I never had anyone uh, talk negative about her. She's such a wonderful girl. She's my everything. And I proposed to her almost a month to the day after I met her. And then almost to a year after that, we got married. September 25th, 2004. And then now I'm going to we had a baby. So we. We do things quick, we don't. <laughs> I can remember when Christian was a tiny, tiny baby, and we would take him into the store, and we would have him sit in the top of the basket, and people would come and say, uh, is he yours? And, oh, you know, what do y'all do? I mean, y'all had a baby? I can remember when Maria got pregnant with Christian, I had people in my family that say, are you sure you want to do this with Maria? Are you sure you want to be a father? Are you sure you're going to be good parents? Why do y'all want to have a kid? You're both handicapped. And you're not scared that he's going to be handicapped. But we learned, both of us have a simple policy. We, we've learned to support each other more and love more than a typical husband and wife. I was able to watch her change my son's diapers with her teeth. Take him, you know, clean him, wipe him, and then pull his diapers up with her teeth if she couldn't do it. And tape it all down with her chin. And never, ever drop that baby. When I started painting, I was married to Maria. We'd been married for three years. But um, I still didn't have, I was still faking my religion. I was still faking it. I, I wasn't happy. I was just going through the motions of being a husband, a young father, and still looking for that fix to make me happy. And I found my, my painting now, my painting is my drug. I started out painting gets me closer to my mom who had passed away. Because she was an artist. And I taught myself how to do all this. The early years were tough. A lot of nights, like Rooney and Cheese, thinking of how we go pay the belt, lights, or how we go pay the rent, struggling. They take everybody else that starts off struggling. But getting up at 3 in the morning to make sure you had a place on Jackson Square, make sure you had somewhere to hang your work four days a week, driving an hour and a half to New Orleans, hour and a half back. Sitting out there in the sun, the cold, the rain, trying to sell artwork. Now all the kids that make fun of me and tease me are coming here to buy my work. It's kind of like a aha moment, you know. <laughs> you give me to buy my work. You know, I have a lot of guys that work for my gallery. And I grew up with them. That, that, that tease me in school and high school. Let it come here, you know, throughout the conversation, they would come back and say, I'm sorry that I ever teach you. I'm sorry I made money. I was like, look, we were kids. You know, we were children. I can't hold that like that against y'all. And then they'd turn around and buy a piece of art. And they're not buying the art because they feel sorry for me to buy the art because they like my art. Well, you can see this art is done from the heart and the, the area and what Hank feels, it's natural, and everybody can relate to what he's painting, his art. 
from the old doors to the chairs to the Nutra skin boards to the area and the shrimp boats and everything is just related to the area. I had to paint the door with him. The way our grandparents and my grandparents found them with the outhouses and the bayous and the pirogs and uh, the cisterns. My style is set back 50 years ago, 60 years ago. It's no way, no thing. It's simpler way of life. And it's just cool about my work is I can take a piece of art and hang it in somebody's living room. And you go to walk in there and you go to see that work and you go say, wow, look at this piece of art. And that piece of art is a piece of Hank. But when they see that piece of art, they don't see Hank. They may not even know who Hank Han is. And they don't do it, Hank Han. Man. They don't know till the conversation gets in the, de in the depth with the owner of the painting. Yeah, he was born with silver poison. What? He has silver poison and he does this? Yeah, amazing. That's God given. When I was painting that painting, I'm not only painting it that moment, I'm pretty much in there dancing, having a good time, shaking a leg, drinking a beer, raising nine kinds of hell with these characters. Because I, I literally take myself out of my human realm for that, minute, for that hour, beer, 10, 20 hours a day to paint this. In my mind, I take myself and I put myself into that painting, and my heart and my soul in that painting. I had to have colors. All the colors I use, I, I, I feel the different colors in my life, in my soul. And that in itself motivates me. I, I do a lot of baptismal stuff. I believe in God. I like to raise hell, but you know, I believe in God and great Christian. So as I paint these Christians, these people being baptized here and here, all that, I can see myself being baptized again. I again affirm myself being baptized. I see the progress of his work. I see the not only not only in the work, but I see how that is all they change him. I mean, we this save. This life is a And it's safe on merch and it's always. As far as I know, I've done extensive research. There ain't no other artist in the world that I know of that signs her name upside down. So having a disability, with my disability, I'm a little bit different than pure normal, or whatever you call normal people. So I wanted my work to be a little different too. And that's the main reason why I'm signing upside down. And I, I'm not self-conscious about my disability anymore. I'm more conscious and I'm proud of it. Like, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. It, de it defies me. It, it's made me who I am as a person, as a father, as a friend, and as an artist. It's who I am. And I, I don't think I don't want to change it. I look at Hank and, and I tell him every time that I really have a chance is that he is the greatest ambassador I think that we can have in the town of Lockport. And it's an honor and a privilege that we have him as a resident and also as a friend. I classify my life in four different divisions. My, the loves of my life, Jesus, my wife and son, my family and friends, and then my art. You know, uh, my art is a piece of who I am, but the whole package makes what I am.